Good morning, good life. My name is David Catrone. I'm one of the elders here, and uh, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, um, your love for us. I thank you that we show up on Sunday not because we have to. We show up on Sunday because we get to hear from you. We get to learn from you. We get to meet with you. Um, We get to be built up by you for the rest of this week. Um, And I pray that this would be life-giving for me and for us as a church that you would speak, that I wouldn't speak, that you would speak, and that you'd meet us here in Daniel 2. pray these things in your name. Amen. So we have been in Daniel. We are in Daniel 2. Um, This is our second week, or third week, I believe, in Daniel. And so I want to preface with, this is a very long chapter. I'm going to do my best to kind of uh, make sure that we understand what's happening in Daniel 2. Uh, before we just sort of dive into what we might be seeing in Daniel 2, because it it can get really easy to do that. When you're in the scriptures, it can get really easy to say, um, here's what I think God is saying to me, right? Or here's what I think this passage is saying, right? But we have to start with the reality of what is actually being said, right? If we don't start there, we're just sort of guessing, right? So I want to kind of quickly run through the passage and then sort of pull out some key points that I think God is teaching us in, in Daniel 2. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Daniel 2, but I'm going to run through most of Daniel 2, but I'm going to do it by uh, kind of abridging certain sections and sort of paraphrasing certain sections. So I'm going to start in Daniel 2, uh, verse 1. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. After this, he calls all the sort of magicians, sorcerers, anybody that might be smart in the kingdom, he calls them and says, uh, bring them all in and, and tell me the interpretation of the dream. They say, we got it. What's the dream? He goes, no, 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 no. If you know how to interpret the dream, you also must know the dream. So I want you to tell me the dream and then interpret it. And they, we can't do that. Then the Chaldean said to the king, oh, king, live tell your servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb. Awesome. And your houses shall be laid in ruins. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. Verse 11, the uh, the thing that the king asks is too difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Because remember, we learned in Daniel 1, that Daniel and his friends have become a part of this kind of council of the king. Daniel's not even in the room when this decree goes out. It's like, well, hey, these guys can't figure it out. Kill them all. I want all the wise men, all the guys who pretend to be wise, get rid of all of them. <clears throat> because of this, the king was angry and very furious, so the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he sh- might show the interpretation of the king. Daniel hears of it and says, hold on a second. Let me get a minute with the king. I'll interpret the dream, right? Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Daniel calls for a time with the king, doesn't know yet the dream, but is thinking, hey, I got one shot at this. Hey, let me get to the king. I'll tell him what the dream is. I don't know it yet. He's saying to himself, let me and my friends, we're going to go to God. We're going to seek mercy. Verse 19, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Verse 25, then Arioch, right, one of the kind of the key people for the king, then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen in its interpretation? Verse 27, Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery the king has asked. But, as for me, verse 30, the mystery has been revealed to me by the God of heaven, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thought of your mind. Then Daniel shares the dream and its interpretation with the king. The dream goes something like this. Um, There's this kind of image of a statue that sort of has these different layers, gold being the top and silver being the next. And Daniel starts to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar, hey, you're this golden kind of head of this statue. And here's what the next kingdom will look like. And here's what the next kingdom after that will look like. And here's the next kingdom after that will look like. But then, 
a stone will come and crush all of these kingdoms. And they will blow away. And then the stone will grow. Right? Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, verse 30, 46, and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. So this is sort of, we just went through 46 verses, right? We're going to go back to them, but I want you to understand the narrative of what's happening, right? King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He wants it interpreted. His magicians, his sorcerers, his fancy people can't figure it out. And he's like, that's it. Tear them all limb from limb, right? Every single one of them, limb from limb. Daniel kind of gets caught in the crossfires of this, right? And says, hold on a second. Let me get time with the king. Doesn't know the dream yet. Doesn't know its interpretation. Let me get time with the king just throwing himself at the mercy of God. And he comes back to his friends and says, we must seek the Lord. And then it says a vision in the night. Who knows how long they sought the Lord? Was it an hour? Was it 10 minutes? Was it all night long and they didn't sleep? You know, like this was this at 8 a.m., right, before they were about to wake up kind of thing? We don't know. But the dream comes to Daniel. The interpretation comes to Daniel. And then he has the courage to believe it and go to the king and say it. Because if he's wrong, definitely dead, right? This is what happens. And the king hears it. He says, you were right. He says, your God is the God of God. Right? This is Daniel 2. So the question for us really becomes, what are we supposed to learn because of this? Right? What are we supposed to hear? What is God teaching us? Right? Because it starts with, like I said earlier, comprehending what is Daniel 2. Okay, we, we have an idea of what's happening. Right? But with Scripture, we're supposed to wrestle with it. Right? It's supposed to be something that we meditate on. We really push through. God, what are you saying? Not what do we want you to be saying. Right? Not what makes me feel warm and fuzzy, but what are you actually saying? Otherwise, why are we here? Right? If we're not going to go to the Scripture and just say, God, what are you actually saying? Then what are, what's the point? Right? I could stand up here and tell you 10 things to make you feel better about your life, but if God didn't say it, what does it matter? It's just a lie. Right? So we're going to dive back into the, that Scripture, back into Daniel 2, and pull out a couple key points. So the first point that really kind of stands out to me is this. And I'm going to kind of say the point. It might be up on the screen. And then we'll kind of work backwards from that. So the first thing that kind of stands out to me is this. God is the sovereign king of the universe. Kel talked about it a lot uh, last week and even the week prior. And we'll see this a lot in Daniel 2. This, this idea of sovereignty, right? The definition really being about kind of all power, all authority, right? When you're a sovereign, you have the power. You have the control. You get to decree things. Right? I think sometimes, though, the problem is with that word sovereignty, it ends up becoming sort of this theology word, this sort of masters of divinity. Like, if you go to school, you'll learn about sovereignty. But for us normal people, it doesn't make any sense. But I think this passage does a great job of sort of fleshing out what does it mean that God is sovereign. It, it's almost exactly how Nebuchadnezzar is sovereign. Like, I want us to start to equate the sovereignty of the king, of the, one of the greatest kings in all of history, Nebuchadnezzar. When I say God is sovereign, I mean sovereign like Nebuchadnezzar was, times a million. So look at what Nebuchadnezzar does. He has a dream. It says in, in, in verse 2, he has this dream that's so powerful he can't sleep, right? And, and if you kind of dive into the text and kind of the original language, you can almost sense that, like, he's waking up in the middle of the night and, like, get everybody. Get them all in my room. I haven't slept in days. I need them to, to interpret this dream. And everyone jumps. Nobody questions. Nobody's like, hey, king, it's early. Let's just wait till the next day, right? And then when they say to the king, they say, king, no one can interpret this dream without you telling us. That, that power lives with the gods. And he literally looks at him and goes, I will tear you limb from limb. This is, your, this, is the, this is the relationship we have. I'm the sovereign king. So I decree something. Tell me the dream or I tear you limb from limb. So when we say God is sovereign, I mean sovereign like that. That when he decides something, it's decided. There's no one who can question it right? That's the craziest part about the story, is that no one, this Ariok guy who's kind of going out to the city to find the guys he has to kill, doesn't say, hey, king, I mean, this is a little too much, right? And never goes, you're right, sorry, let's just, I don't want to kill anybody, just beat him up a little bit, right? Like, there's no negotiation, there's no conversation. He's a king, he decrees it, and it happens, right? Like, this is what it means to be sovereign. And what I want us to understand is that when we say that God is sovereign, we mean that the God of the universe has total power, and total authority. But here's the difference. It is hard for us to understand what it means to be sovereign and to have no limits. I'm sovereign in my household, 
right? I have power and authority, right, with my wife. My, Hutz, my son Hudson doesn't understand that, right? My son Eli doesn't fully understand that. The other night we're at dinner, he wants to sleep over at his grandma's house, and he goes, all right, I, I'm going to make a deal with you. And we're like, all right, Eli, what's the deal? He goes, if you don't let me sleep at grandma's house, you have to pay me $50. I'm like, no, right? But he doesn't understand that. This is, but this is what it's like for us. We look at a sovereign God, and we're like, all right, let's make a deal. And God said, no, I don't owe anything to anybody, and I have no limits on my power. I am everywhere, all the time, at every second of the day. Nothing limits me. And I have full control and full power. So when we say God is sovereign, we mean that all of human history, Charles Spurgeon said this way, there is not a rogue particle in the universe, past, present, or future, that God is not in control of. Right? It's not a rogue particle. God is sovereign over all things. He is king over all things. And when, I, when, I, when you think of that idea of sovereignty, I want you to think about Nebuchadnezzar, right? I want you to think about what it looked like then. No one questioned it. No one said this is unfair. It just was. He just was sovereign, right? This is the God of the universe. He is sovereign over the whole universe, so much so that every king that has ever walked the face of the earth God could change his dreams. God can make him lose sleep. You see what I'm saying? Do you want to see what I'm getting at? Like, so sovereign that the most sovereign at the time, King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings the world has ever seen, God woke him up and said, you're not going to sleep this week. You see what I'm saying? This is the God of the universe. And I don't want you to think that that somehow was some fairy tale in the past. That happens now. I can guarantee you that King, Kim Jong-un of North Korea wakes up some nights panicking about the God of the universe. I can guarantee it because that God still works today. Joe Biden doesn't matter. My God's sovereign. Donald Trump doesn't matter. My God is sovereign. Right? They're many sovereigns, right? They have some power here today, but they're not sovereign over the universe. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? Like, God sent his people, we learned this last week, God sent his people into exile. He decreed it. It happened. All in Jeremiah, the people are saying, it's not going to happen. Jeremiah's like, I don't know what to tell you. It's coming. Nothing stops the God of the universe. He is sovereign over all things. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14 says this. I'm not going to read all of it. Jeremiah 29, we, we've all heard this verse before. For, for I know the plans I have for you, this beautiful verse. But let's read the kind of earlier passage. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14, it says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this is Jeremiah speaking on God's behalf, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, go and do this in exile. I did it. God's like, I did it. God is sovereign over all things, even the hardships, even the suffering, even the the evil. Everything that you or I will encounter in our lives, God is completely, 100% in control of. That is a very, very hard pill to swallow. But I'm not here to tell you what I want to say. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear. God is the supreme sovereign over everything. Isaiah 45, 6 through 9. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light, and I create darkness. I make well-being, and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay, listen to this, does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, what are you in labor for? Should the created say to God, why are you doing what you're doing? God is in control of all things. We merely respond to that. We merely live in light of that. This is a really, really hard reality in the Bible. 
to grapple with the reality that God is sovereign over all things, even this calamity that befalls the Jewish people. These 70 years of exile, God ordains it. Right? God institutes it. God decrees it, just like Nebuchadnezzar does. And nobody stops God. When he decides something, it happens. Sometimes when I'm talking with people and we talk about this reality, they say, I could, I could never believe in a God like that. I could never believe in a God who's in control of even the evil, even the suffering that we experience in our life. And I always ask them this simple question. What's the alternative then? Are you telling me the alternative is when evil happens, when suffering happens, your God was up in heaven going, I wish I could stop it? I just can't. He's not in control. You're telling me that's the alternative you want? You want to live in a world where that when suffering happens, the God of the universe says, I wish I could stop it. No. I want a God that looks at me and says, do you trust me? Tears in his eyes, weeping with us, saying, in the midst of suffering, do you trust me? Do you trust me? This is the reality that Daniel is dealing with. God is a sovereign king. Daniel is in a foreign land as an exile, throwing himself at the mercy of God. Why? Because he knows that his God is sovereign. That there's nothing that God will respond to him and say, sorry, Daniel, this is the limit of my power. Do you realize that? God has to be sovereign. Otherwise, we are hopeless. I don't ever want God to respond to me and say, Dave, I did all I could. I want him to look at me and say, in all things, I'm on the throne. What I say happens. God is the sovereign king of the universe. Point two. We must live humbly in light of God's sovereignty like Daniel does. We must live humbly in light of God's sovereignty like Daniel does. Because when we start to think about God being sovereign over the universe, sovereign over all things, full power over all things, good and evil, right? The question becomes, okay, now, how do we live in light of that? We need to live like Daniel does, humbly. Think about Daniel. I, I thought about this a lot last week when, when, when Kel was sharing about sort of Daniel being convicted over his diet and saying, hey, I really want to follow the Jewish law. I want to eat a certain way. I don't want to, de you know, defile myself with the king's food. If that's me, in all honesty, we get, like, swept up into some exile, some war happens in the U.S., and I'm, like, some, some like, forced slave laborers in some other country, I'm done, right? I'm like, listen, feed me whatever. Like, I don't know about this whole Jesus thing. This is crazy, right? But that's because of my lack of faith. Daniel says, no, no, I want to keep following this God because I, I trust in his sovereignty. Even in the calamity that befalls me, I know that he's in control. God's not up there panicking, thinking, oh, my gosh, my people are in exile. What do I do? No, God decreed it. Daniel understands that he lives in, in, in light of that reality. We are called to live in light of that, like Daniel does. He responds by being convicted of the same things and to, to honor God in the same way. And then look at how he even responds, right? Look at how Daniel even responds to this reality. Daniel's not, now imagine, Daniel's not in the room when the king has this dream. He has no idea what's happening, right? He's, you know, it's year two, but technically it's about year three, Daniel's been there, you know, a year or two now in the kind of the exile. He's sort of getting his feet underneath him. He's like, all right, I got a pretty good gig. Like, I got my diet figured out. Like, the king doesn't mind me so much. I'm kind of in, you know, I'm, I'm actually not in a terrible spot. Guy just walks up and goes, hey, got to tear you from limb from limb today. And he's like, well, hold on, what happened? I thought I was doing a good job, right? He's not even in the room when the king has this dream. He's not even able to save himself. And how does Daniel respond? Then Daniel replied, it says, verse 14, Daniel 2. Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. With prudence and discretion. I would not be prudent or discreet. I would be like, all right, guys, Time for a coup. Like, it's the four of us. Like, what we got, right? Like, and I think a lot of Christians, a lot of us, right? The wrong president is in office. We're like, all right, we got to figure out something. Like, can the states secede? Can we, like, change? Like, what's, what's our response? We got to fight against this. 
right? Because this isn't fair. This isn't how God would want it. So I'm going to yell and scream and complain on Facebook. What does Daniel say? Tell me why this is happening. Hey, can I get time with the king? Let me talk to the king. Ariok could have said no and torn him limb from limb right there. Why is Daniel able to be like this? Because he doesn't panic because his God has never panicked. No matter what suffering you experience, no matter what calamity you experience, no matter what horrible situation you find yourself in, you can say, my God is in control. To the world, it doesn't look like he is, but he is. This is Daniel. He responds with this kind of patient request. He doesn't know the dream, but he has this kind of like humble faith of like, hey, can I get time with the king? I'm hoping God meets me there, <laughs> right? Like, he gets it. And then what does he do? He prays. Daniel prays. He throws himself at God's mercy. When your God is sovereign, when your God is, when nothing can stop your God, then your prayers actually work. That's the thing about sovereignty. When, when, when people hear about God being completely in control, they're like, then why would I pray? God already knows what's going to happen. Why would I pray? Why would you pray if God wasn't in control? If God's not in control, what are you praying for? God's up there like, hey, I'm, I'm trying my best. I got levers. I'm pulling whatever I can pull to make this happen, but I'm not in control. There's other things at work here, right? You pray to a God who actually has full authority. I do whatever I want. And, he, and then that God says, come to me. Pray to me. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Like, that's who we're praying to. Daniel prays to that God. Then Daniel went to his house, made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven. Seek mercy. Sometimes I hear about how, we, how some Christians navigate prayer with God, and they navigate it like a demand. No, God, you need to do this. I heard someone once say, God, they deserve this healing. No, they don't. No, they don't. We don't deserve mercy. It's not mercy. Mercy isn't deserved. It's undeserved. We pray as people knowing we are owed the worst thing God can come up with. The worst thing God can come up with, that's what I'm owed. So I pray as a humble, like, God, I, have no, I can't woo you, God. I can't make you. I can't force you. This is how Daniel prays. God, have mercy on me. Right? I think about the passage in Luke where it says there was two men, one who, who walked up with all his kind of robes on and said, I am not like the sinner. Look at how I give. Look at all these things. And he was so comfortable to come to church bold. And there was another man afraid to even walk in the building. And he cried to himself, Lord, have mercy on me. He was too afraid to even go in the building. God said, that second man, that second man knows me. That's how we pray. We need to pray like Daniel prays. God, have mercy on us. And if you don't, you're good. You're sovereign. And even if you don't, Daniel knew when he was praying with his friends, he knew there was a possibility they finished that night with no answer. And that Daniel would have to walk into the king saying, I can't interpret your dream. That's how we pray. Bad, you get a bad um, diagnosis of the doctor, that's how you pray. Right? Something happens, I'll make it personal. Something happens to Hudson or Eli or my wife. Golly, that's how I want to pray. God have mercy on me. We must live humbly in light of God's sovereignty like Daniel did. We don't want to rage against his sovereignty. God, how could you do this? Look at all I've done for you, Daniel could have said. I ate the diet. I'm in exile. I ate the diet. I've done everything. And now this, now I'm going to die for no reason? I wasn't even in the room, God. That's sometimes how we come to God, like, like the clay yelling at the potter. What are you doing? Come, God, have mercy on us. And he wants to. That's the beauty of it. God is not Nebuchadnezzar. He actually gets great pleasure in giving you mercy. Sometimes in the healing, and sometimes in the suffering after the healing doesn't come. But I can guarantee you he gives the mercy. But how are we to live humbly? 
I'm calling us to live humbly. The Bible's calling us to live hum- humbly. But how? By what encouragement should we live humbly before a sovereign God in control of everything? By this truth. God's sovereignty has one goal. Has one singular goal. God's sovereignty has one goal. It's the suffering Christ glorified. When suffering befalls us, when exile happens, when we get kicked out of our land, whatever it is, imagine Daniel's situation. When that happens, our hope in that moment is that God has a plan. That God's going somewhere with our suffering. God's doing something here. It's all about the suffering Christ glorified. So I didn't go super in-depth with the was sort of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. But I'm going to talk about it a little bit. I think that I honestly could spend a whole sermon just talking about this dream, and so I'm trying to kind of manage my time here. But, but this dream is essentially this, this kind of prophecy about the next four, five kind of kingdoms that are coming down the line. And Daniel writes this with almost perfect detail. Historians look at it and go, he must have written it after these things happened. There's no way he could have, he could have predicted this almost perfectly predicting exactly how some of these these kingdoms will come and and they will fall, right? So God is kind of telling his people, yes, Nebuchadnezzar is king. And then another king will come, and then another king. But then God says this. This is uh, Daniel kind of interpreting the dream. He says, uh, And as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so he's describing this sort of body that has these different metals and elements. He says, as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, this sort of image of a royal king. So they will mix with one another in marriage, but they're not held together, just as iron does not mix with the clay. And in the days of those kings, right, these kind of last kingdom at the bottom, right, it's kind of like gold and then silver and kind of bronze kind of goes down this whole body. As it goes down to the body to the feet, sort of the last kingdom, it says this. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and they'll stand forever. So it's, it talks about this idea of this rock coming and destroying all the kingdoms and then growing and taking over the whole earth. And some hist- historians kind of point to this that last kingdom as being the Roman kingdom when Christ is born. The stone, think about it. You have gold, silver, bronze, and then you have stone. Just earth, stone. Why the symbolism? Because God puts on flesh. Right? He's not some special. He doesn't come down as a, as a superhero. Right? He doesn't come down in armor. He comes down as a baby like a stone. And yet the stone defeats all the gold, the silver, the bronze, right? Christ, the cornerstone, right? Hundreds of years before Jesus comes, it says that one day a stone will come. What does Jesus refer to himself as? He says, I'm the cornerstone. Hundreds of years before Christ comes, there's this symbolism, this dream that a pagan king has about this future kingdom that will never stop that God will make happen. How do I live in light of a sovereign God who who decrees all things, even the suffering that I endure? It's because I know he's got a point, a plan, a a, a focus of all these things. And what is it? It's my redemption. It's my only hope. It's his son crucified. It's the gospel. It's the good news. Hundreds of years before, the, before Jesus ever comes, it's the gospel. This has always been the plan. If, if, if you've ever read the Old Testament, I, I said this to someone last night. If you're reading the Old Testament, I want to tell you what it's about. It's about Jesus. The Old Testament was not God's plan A that failed. Like, well, this law thing doesn't really work. What was I thinking? Let's come up with a different plan. Plan A has always been Christ on the cross. If you read the Old Testament, look deeply into it. It's all about Christ. Adam and Eve, they sin, right? God curses uh, the snake, and God says this. He says, one day, her seed will crush you. 
And this, this beautiful line right after that. Eve is not named before that. Eve is not named before the sin. Right after that, Adam looks at his wife and says, I will call her Eve. Why? Because Adam heard the gospel. God told Adam the gospel. He said, one day, yes, death is coming. One day, I will send my son through her. And he will crush him. Snake. Adam, I can imagine, tears in his eyes. I'm going to call her Eve. The mother who all who lives, of, of all who lives. The gospel is in every line of the Bible. And we hear it in this passage. God telling a pagan king, my kingdom's coming. And no one can stop it because I'm a better sovereign than you are, Nebuchadnezzar. So how do I live in light of this? How do I live humbly? It's because I know God has a plan. I know God is working on something. It's Christ crucified on the cross and, God, and Christ glorified in heaven. That all of my suffering, all of our suffering, everything we endure today, the worst things we endure today, with tears and with weeping and with groans we can't even describe, we will stand in front of God one day and say, thank you. We will say, thank you for moving my life the way that you did to get me here so that I might rejoice in you. Every scene in the Old Testament points us to the gospel. Every story, Daniel, the rest of Daniel, all of these, these prophecies, God was working his people to this moment where Christ would be born, where he would die, and then he's working us to the day where we stand before him on the throne. Right? This is all of what God is doing. Every sovereign, sovereign tiny event in your life, that is what God is working towards. So when you read the scriptures, I want you to look for it. And even when we read this chapter, I want you to see it. So not only does the big narrative of God talk about the gospel, but even the small ones, we can find the narrative as well. Because God is obsessed with you and I hearing his, his desire to save us, his gracious pursuit of us. I want you to think about this passage again. I want you to think about Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to think about the magicians. I want you to think about Daniel. I want you to ask the question, who am I in this story? Oftentimes, we can have this idea of like, I need to be like Daniel. I need to be like King David. When we read the Old Testament, we see these heroes of the faith and go, I need to be like him. That's who God's calling me to be like. I don't think that's really the case all the time. Yeah, sure, we can exemplify some of their characteristics, but these are sinners. When you hear this story, I want you to see yourself as the magicians, the small character. The king says, tell me the dream. And the magicians say, that's impossible. And King says, tear them limb from limb. And then Daniel, not in the room, didn't commit the crime that they had committed, comes to the rescue. They didn't ask him. They didn't do anything that warranted it. Daniel comes to their rescue. This is the gospel. You are the magician. I am the magician. God says, be perfect. He says, be holy as I am holy. Obey my law. We say, we can't. He goes, tear them limb from limb. He goes, then hell is your destination. Then for all of eternity, you will be punished far away from me because you have not been holy. And a character that we did not woo, a man that we did not call, says, hold on a second. I'll stand in the way. I'll make a way. This is the gospel. This is the story of the gospel. You and I are the magicians. Hopeless. Completely hopeless. They could do nothing to woo King Nebuchadnezzar. They tried. Well, hold on. Just, just explain the dream a little bit. There was nothing they could do. The king had decided death was their decree. That is your decree. That is our decree. If you are far from Jesus in the room, if you are on the fence, I, I want to be really crystal clear. The Bible is very, very clear. The decree is death. The wages of sin, what you have been working towards, is death. But there's a guy like Daniel, his name is Jesus, who said, I'll go before God on your behalf. 
and I will call out and say, have mercy on me. This is the exchange. We are not Daniel. We are these magicians, hopeless. Hopeless. But Daniel stood in the place. So what will you do? Will you, the clay, cry out to God and say, this is unfair? It shouldn't be this way. Or will you respond to the gospel, the good news, that he has made a way, that someone that wasn't you stood in your place? A better Daniel came along in Christ. I'll end with this. An illustration I use a lot is this kind of illustration um, that, a, that an old monk used where he says, I can almost imagine this moment in heaven when God the Father looks at my sins. He says, look, at, look at all of David's sins. He must pay for these sins. I have decreed it so. He must pay for these sins. And Jesus says, let me see the bill that he owes. God shows him the bill, and Jesus looks at it and says, what if I pay the bill? And God the Father says, son, if you pay the bill, if I have mercy on David, I will not have mercy on you. I will pour out every ounce of wrath that he deserves. And Jesus looks at him and says, I can drink that cup. So when Jesus was on the cross, and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he actually was forsaken. So that you wouldn't be. So that I wouldn't be. So that when I cry out to God, and I say, have mercy on me, God, like Daniel does, he actually will have mercy on me. Because he didn't have mercy on Christ. And then when that was over, I can almost imagine Christ walking up the gates of heaven as he ascends up the stairs. Looks at his father and he goes, it is finished. And the father says, it's finished indeed. How will you respond to that? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the good news. I thank you for the gospel. Um, I thank you that you love to have mercy on us that in the good times and the bad times, you are in control. I pray for good life. I pray that we would hear that, that that truth, that beautiful, beautiful, hard truth would seep down into our bones, and seep down into every nook and cranny of our lives, that we would trust you and believe in you and hope in you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you. When we were hopeless, when we had no shot at salvation, when we weren't even asking for salvation, you saved us. I pray that we would respond humbly.